Ladies and gentlemen, the face on the screen in front of you is a, an ex-wife of mine. And she's happy you can to say and because there there are at least two. Well, there are at least two, and in fact, uh, let's see how many there are. Four. Well, there. If you include the current wife, there have been four wives. No, no, no. She's not a former wife. Oh, okay. So she's a current wife. So I have three former wives. You were number <laughs> two. Hey, you know what? I have a neighbor who has five former husbands. Really? <laughs> well. That's uh, that's interesting. I uh, um, I remember once uh, when we were breaking up, you said to me, you know, you've never engraved anything on my on our wedding on my wedding ring. Did I say that? Yeah. Okay. Because I hadn't. Uh, I gave you a ring. I didn't have it engraved. We we're going to have it engraved. Never got engraved. And I said, well, it's because time. I. Time. It's, it's said because I I never could figure out what to put on it. I said, but I think I finally have. And you said, oh, what? And I said, number two in a series. Oh, and you didn't even know what you were talking about yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how are you, Ronnie? Well, Ronnie guess, Bennett, by the way, yeah. Guess what? what? Get what? I bought the medical aid in dying drugs. Really? And they arrived. They arrived. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, it changes. It's been a couple of weeks. Um, you know, until they were, you know, they came in a, oh, you will love this more than most people. Um, I was on a video call with my palliative care physician mm -hmm. when there was a knock at the door. Mm -hmm. Just like sitting here now. So I excused myself. I said, I'll be right back. Went to the door. And it was a courier with this box. So I came back and I said, look what arrived <laughs> while I'm talking to the palliative care physician. <laughs> and, um, and up until that point, the drugs were theoretical. They're not real yet, you know? Right, right. And now they're real. And uh, so uh, I looked at them. There are four bottles. Four little bottles, one medium bottle, and uh, and their instructions. And uh, you know, I think, at least in my case, once you've seen those, once they are in your house, once you have handled them, they're not very far from your mind most of the time. Explain that a bit. They're not that far from your mind. You're always thinking about them? It's not always thinking about them, but what I do is I picture where I want to be when I take them in the house. Mm -hmm. I know who I want to have here, and I picture them. Um, I oh, you know the um, the pharmacy uh, called me when they were filling the prescription, and this is not something that they just take off the shelf. They have it's a compounding pharmacy, and right. they have to the mixtures and he said do you want do you want childproof or easy open caps <laughs> I mean, we're talking about death drugs yeah i think it put uh, uh childproof on all of them no i chose the other oh really yes because i pictured myself maybe standing in the kitchen okay yeah and you take them in a certain order over the period of an hour and trying to get them open and not being able to when maybe I'm in pain and I'm just tired of living and then I drop it and it breaks on the floor. So I went for easy open. <laughs> now, you were saying the other day, and the reason for that being a consideration was that uh, no one else can administer these but you. Right. Other states may do that differently, but in Oregon, and they reiterate the doctor reiterated that to me when we were going through the protocols that are required mm -hmm. by the, to get the drugs. Yeah. Um, that um, I just forgot the question. Uh, the, the question, uh, now I forgot the question that you <laughs> got the question. Two old people trying to do it. Okay, these are two old people <laughs> trying to do them. Yeah. Uh, no, I said that you, you said that uh, they have to be administered by you. They can't be administered by right. someone else. Right. So, 
Yeah. So you have to be of... of uh, oh, you have to be able to do that. Right. And I read something online that's very interesting just in the past few days. I'm not sure if it's Oregon. You know, there are 10 states that allow this now. Mm -hmm. And Washington, D.C. And so I don't remember what if it was a state they were referring to or just in general, but at least somewhere they're not allowed to dispense these drugs to people with Alzheimer's. And one of the oh. protocols uh, before I could have the drugs was one of my doctors had to certify that I am in a sound mind. But the, the article that I was reading about Alzheimer's and these drugs is that that means a whole lot of people that we know perfectly well what's going to happen if you have Alzheimer's or some other kind of disease can't have the drugs. And is that fair? And what would be a fair way of allowing them to have drugs? And it's all up in the air. Nobody's made any decisions about it, but it's being discussed. My question would be, okay, so to begin with, the reason you have this drug is because when you're in so much pain and death is imminent, <clears throat> you're going to want to take this to be able to go out on your own terms. Let's, it doesn't have to be pain. It could be other things. Yeah, it could be other things. Anyway, um, uh, Oh, I, I know another thing. Trump gets reelected. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'm doing my damnedest to hold on for the results of the election, just not not just voting day. Yeah. Well, I mean, the way you look right now, you're going to last through the election and then some. And we'll see. Well, uh, either that or you got a Maybe great make. Go along, I'm told. It, it, you go along, you go along, you go along, and then you drop off a cliff. So. It, either that or you've got a great makeup artist. Well, uh, I do know. have some makeup on. Yeah, I know you have but makeup very on, but I'm I'm just saying. Anyway, the point the point I'm making is uh, that that uh, if you had Alzheimer's, I don't know if you would be of the presence of mind to say I need the drug now. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, it's I don't not about now. You can you never ever have to use the drugs, but it's but what was being argued in this article that I read was that in the early stages of Alzheimer's. There probably is not a reason to deny the drugs. Yeah. I mean, then, of course, if you do get them in that position and then later the, the disease has progressed and you want to use them, you have to remember where you put them, which is a problem I was concerned about about me. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, I don't have dementia because quite a few things that I don't use much, but I want to be sure to know where they are, that when I put them somewhere, I make a mental note, oh, those are there, and then the time comes and I want them and I can't remember where I put them. So what I did with that, I wrote it down in a notebook where I keep them, and I told two people where I keep them. So among those three things, if I forget, someone can help me out. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I just, I don't know if I could do what you're doing. I, I don't know if I could I, well, I can't say because I'm not in that position. Okay? So, uh, you know, but... Alex, the, the, the thing is, I can't either. But what puts me where we're, di where we're in different situations... Yeah. I don't have a husband. I don't have somebody living with me. If I get to the point where I can't take care of myself, feed myself, can't get out of bed, all that sort of thing... I just, you know, if no way am I going to a nursing home. I just, you can't, nobody. Well, I, I mean, I, look, we yeah. know that the eventuality in this, and I'm, I, people may think I'm being coarse when <clears throat> I say this, but she understands what I'm saying. The, uh, the, initial, the eventual outcome of this is death, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and that being the case, you have to judge when you are so uncomfortable that you'd rather go out <laughs> on your own terms rather than suffer the long, and maybe not long, uh, procedure of, of dying naturally. Right, and you yeah. don't know. That's the point. Yeah. And, you know, if this, if I didn't have these diseases, I would just go on and we'll see what's happening, you know? But I know what's happening. And, um, you know, I wondered about knowing when to do it, and I asked two of my doctors and a nurse my hospice nurse, and the, all of whom have attended patients when they took these drugs. Mm -hmm. They've been present. And one of them 
who heads up the little department that runs this at the medical center where I've been treated all these three years, he's attended more than 180. And all of them said separately, it wasn't like they were in a room agreeing with each other. All of them said that every patient that they've been there, they believe chose the, a good time to do it. Mm -hmm. it and, that, and, she, and they've all said to me, Ronnie, you will know. And that's been their experiences with everyone that they've been with. It could so, be there is something instinctual in you as a human being <coughs> that says now's the time. You know, you know, when my last cat was getting ready to die, yeah, um, I have a like a hutch in the dining room, and at the bottom there are doors, four doors, into storage area, and he always would pull it. Well, all his life, he'd go there and pull it. When he never would get it open, he just would go bang, 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 it'd drive me nuts. Um, he was doing that when he was really sick. And so I opened the door and he crawled in there and curled up. So I went and got some towels so he could be comfy and everything in there. <clears throat> and he stayed inside there. I left the door ajar uh, so I could reach in and pet him and we could mm -hmm. talk to each other. But he knew and he, to where he wanted to be for this, his final three or two or three or four days, whatever it was. Yeah. I kept a bowl of water in there. He wasn't interested in eating. And I changed the towels because he'd become incontinent. Mm -hmm. And um, and lots of animals do that. They go off by themselves when the time has come. Yeah, yeah. You know? well, maybe, maybe being what all the, the two doctors and the nurse said about their patients, they believe chose the right time. Maybe that's what we do too in some circumstances. Well, I, I'm just saying that, <laughs> that there's gotta be something at play <clears throat> in that process that says, okay, now's the time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what that is. I, I'm not faced with that, at least not now. I may be eventually. Um, One of the things that when you asked about how I feel about this now is I more frequently have thoughts that are, oh, damn, I am so tired of this. It must be time to go. Um, the, on all different kinds of circumstances, whether I've dropped something in the kitchen or Trump has done something outrageous again. Um, I, I, just a, a wide variety of different kinds of annoying things cause me to think, geez, does this mean it's time? I mean, I, it, it feels yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I, all I'm saying is I've always had a great fear of death. Okay, and I still do. Most of us do. Most of us it, do. Well, I mean, but mine has been, I don't know, pathological. I don't know. I mean. Uh, Why do you think I did the psilocybin trip? Well, exactly. Uh, you said, though, that that has started to wear off, the effect of that, the lessons you learned on psilocybin. Do you mm -hmm. wish maybe you had taken it later rather than then? Well, you can't do that. You don't know how much time you have. Well, apparently, you've had a lot of time. <laughs> but I didn't know that then. You know. I mean, they told me that with the surgery that I had in 2017, I would have probably a year. Without it, I would have a few months. So I wasn't thinking that I would be here more than a year after that. Yeah. And you've been here how long? Over three years. Over three years. From so diagnosis. Yeah. But, you know, so I have this, this great fear of death. My father who we always like to refer to every now and then because he, he always came up to saying the right thing at the right time. One time he was I, a great guy. I even told him as far back as then, and I was, you know, in my teens, Dad, I'm afraid of death. I have this morbid fear of death. And he said, well, don't worry about it. You've been there before. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, before you were born. And all my life now, it has terrified me to think of what it was like before I was born. You know, I mean, it, 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 the, the concept of not existing isn't a concept I can wrap my mind around, mainly because I'm, I'm used to but existing. You're not unique. No, I know I'm not unique. But we I, all have that. But, like, for instance, my wife, she says, I, I don't care. I have no fear of death. She, and she really doesn't. <laughs> 
she said, you know, compared to what's going on these days, I hope I go soon. You know, I mean, because of, of, of Trump and so on. And uh, I go, you know, I just can't, I can't have that same philosophy. It's not that I love life. It's not like I've embraced life and I've been a joyous, live person. You know, God knows that's not true. But See, I, I really like being alive. Well, I, but I, I do. Think being I, alive I, I, is I, let me put it this way. I'd rather be alive than dead. OK. <laughs> Isn't this a wonderful discussion, folks? I wonder if we only have one person left watching us. You know, <laughs> today's subject, ladies and gentlemen, death. You know, yes. yes, it should be more part of living than it is. I really believe that. Well, you know what you've I done. Other countries. I'll tell you what you've but done. The, yeah, but can I say something? You, what you've done here with these week, with every other week chats we've had, and talking about this is, I think you've made it more comfortable for other people. I hope so. I hope so. You know, there's not very much written about the pro process of dying. Um, there's one book by um, a neurosurgeon named Paul Kalanithi, mm -hmm. who's way too young, I think in his late 30s, um, of cancer. And during the period of time from diagnosis to when he died, he kept a book that was published posthumously called When Breath Becomes Air. And that is the best first person account of this period of time that I've ever read. And believe me, I have hundreds and hundreds of books on aging and death and dying and that sort of thing. Um, it, it's just a brilliant, brilliant book because he was just deadly honest. It, whether he was in lots of pain, yeah. whether he was joyous about the birth of his baby. I mean, think about having a baby knowing you'll never see that kid grow up, that in the next few months you'll be dead. Yeah. Oh, that must be painful, you know? It, it might be painful, but, you know, the funny part is um, uh, everybody was amazed when I was diagnosed with, uh, <coughs> with prostate cancer uh, that I didn't panic in the least, you know, because I have such a fear of death and so on. That I, but I didn't panic at all. I just went, okay, we'll get the radiation. Okay, we'll get the seeds. And I handled it with people couldn't believe how I was handling it. They knew me too well. I should have been screaming and yelling, "Oh my God, I'm going to die! Do you think I'm going to die? Do you?" No, it was quite the opposite. People said, even Marjorie said, "You know, I can't believe how calm you've been about this diagnosis." Well, so what else I know are you going to be. What else can you well, do? what I'm saying is, I don't know if I were in your position how I would react to it because I might have the same reaction. I might say, "Okay, I know what's going to happen now, so this, <coughs> why, why panic over it?" You know, I mean, uh, my whole attitude with the cancer thing was, "Well, I got it." So, uh, and I've always worried about getting it, as you know, uh, but I got it, and now that I have it, uh, let's do something about it. You know, and I was just very straightforward. About, and it, at no point did I panic. And, of course, I had a doctor. When I looked at him, I said, is this the thing that's going to kill me? He looked at me and he went, no. You know, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I mean, it, it, I didn't panic about that. So I don't know if, if faced with what you're faced with, if I wouldn't react in a way other than I believe I would react, which would be, oh, my God, I'm going to die. You know. Yeah, how many times can you say that? I mean, it's not a sustainable it, position. It is. It, it, quoting Trump, it is what it is. You know. Uh, uh, it, Let's it, not go there. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, you just have to accept it. And you, you have handled it just beautifully. I mean, just wonderfully. Well, all I do is be whatever it is I am today. Well, I know what your answer would be. I have no other choice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it... Um, I have bad times, but I think that all the stuff of daily life, whether it's washing dishes, cooking a meal, getting the laundry done, writing a blog post, whatever, um, I've got more to do than there's time. And I have very little time these days. I tire so easily that, you know, you have about 16 hours a day of time. I have less than eight a day to do everything I used to do in twice as much time. Wow. I'm always behind. There's always something to do. 
a lot of it is mundane, stupid stuff, as I said, like laundry and doing the dishes. But others is really interesting. And there's plenty of books to read and TV shows or movies that I'd like to see and people to talk to um, on the phone or via Zoom like this. And, there's, and, and that takes me out of myself when it gets to be hard. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just, you know, I just, I think that by the fact that you're just doing this <coughs> is a service to people who someday uh, might be facing what mm -hmm. you're facing. Uh, I hope so. And, and, I mean, otherwise, I'm just talking to myself. Well, I mean, like, I'm sure there are people who are watching this who are in this situation who are saying to themselves, she's making it easier on me. So, you you know, you've done a real service that way. I hope so. You I know. hope so, because otherwise I'm just self-indulgent. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that would be true. Um, so, uh, anyway, enough about death. We got about uh, <laughs> we got about four minutes left here. Uh, what do you think about the state of our nation? Oh. I just, there's you know there's hardly any point in reading the news anymore. Um, somebody asked me this morning if I'd been watching the Democratic convention, such as it is. No, why? I don't see why. I, 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 I I've been watching a certain speech. I can go yeah. to YouTube. It'll be there. Um, I've been watching it because I'm fascinated by how they've managed to pull this off. And they've done a pretty good job of it, you know? Well, I don't know because I didn't watch it. In fact, I, I kind of like it more than the normal conventions because you haven't got all the balloons It's television. That's all it is. Yeah. I've watched little bits and pieces, and they're just doing the Zoom meeting, a giant Zoom meeting, you know? Yeah, but they did the roll call of the states last night, and it was, it was, it was you know, interesting. I know all the state names. I know, but you don't know that they're the great state where so-and-so was from. You know what? I'm 79 years old. Do you know how many times I've heard those words said at conventions? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, been there. What they did? It doesn't interest me. It's, it's funny, you know, the thing about being a short-timer yeah. is it's real clear what's important to pay attention to and what isn't. And there's no reason to tune into this. Okay, what is number one on your list of the most important things? To pay oh, pay? I don't rank them like that. I can't. Okay, but what is? What are a couple of them then? Um, to spend time, whether it's this way or in person, with people I care about. Mm -hmm. Um, to. You know, one of the things about writing my blog about this period in my life. Mm -hmm is that I'm trying to explain it to myself what I feel or think. Mm -hmm. I'm not real good at knowing that until I write it down. So if I weren't doing a blog post about this stuff, I would still be writing it down somewhere because, you know, William Faulkner, novelist of the early 20th century, <clears throat> once said, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? And what, I read that in my 20s and I went, wow, yes because I'm right here stumbling at your question because I don't know for sure. But if when we hang up, if I went over and wrote, started writing about what are the top three most important things to me at this point in my life, mm -hmm. just write and write and write and write until I could finally get somewhere. And that's how I do those things. So, so, so writing is really it, important to me. So writing is very important to the process yeah. that you're going through. Because you can say whether it were for publication or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, so and yeah. also, yeah. also, what is really important, something I've done all my life, but much more pointed now, is I'm always like there's a piece of me sitting over here watching me, mm -hmm. and I'm always watching how am I reacting to this, and this is you know we just sat here and talked about your fear of death. I have fear of death, maybe not as much as before. But it's there. Yeah. I'm watching myself react to all of this all the time. And not just this, though, but when I run out of breath, how it makes me feel, how do I handle it? And I do that a lot because of the COPD. And I forget that I can't walk New York speed anymore, so that gets me in trouble. And, um, and I just watch when I read something that, that seems to affect me in some way. I'm, there's a piece of me also looking at my reaction to see how I'm reacting mm -hmm. to it. Um, and that's important to me. I've always done that in my life. But 
Uh, this is warm. This is, hey, you know, this is the biggest event of my life. Sorry about being married to you there, but it comes below that. Oh, well, okay. And uh, it's the biggest event since being born, which I don't remember. And I want to pay attention mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a very specific, pointed way. And see, see what it does to me and how I respond. Well, we've run out of time. I mean... I don't mean oh, that. just as well. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean that in any morbid fashion. I mean just we've run out of time. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> uh, we've run out of time uh, for this edition of the uh, Ronnie and Alex get together. But uh, I know we'll see you in another two weeks. I mean, yes. you don't look like somebody who's going day after tomorrow. So, no, barring. Getting hit by a truck, I think I'm okay. And I never want to lose you. Never. You know? Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, you can find her on uh, timegoesby.net. That's her blog. It's about what it's like to live and in some ways what it's and like to, to die. die. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. We'll talk soon.